Okay, so today we're going to do some review of electrical principles. We're going to look at a little bit of everything in this entire unit. Uh, I don't want to eat too much of your time today because, of course, most of the beginning of this week needs to be spent working on that major slideshow project. Um, but hopefully some of the stuff I put through in this slideshow will actually help you decide what you want to put in yours, right? So a lot of the ideas that are in here uh, could just be put right in your slideshow as well. Anyway, here we go. So today's plan, we're going to quickly cover all the concepts from the entire unit. There they all are. I'm not going to list them out. We'll go through them as we go. Here we go. All right, first things first. The very beginning of this unit, we talked about static and current electricity. So you need to understand the difference, even though they are very similar concepts. Static electricity is where the charges stay on one object and don't flow. Uh, so if you have a negative charge, all that means is it gained electrons. Whereas if you have a positive charge, that just means it lost electrons. Uh, now, current electricity is where the electrons, however, are flowing from one atom or ion to the next, right? So in other words, they're not just staying in one place. They're actually moving from one place to the next. Uh, that's pretty much all that you really need to know uh, about the difference of it. Of course, static electricity uh, does have its own properties, of course, like static electricity can be transferred from one surface to another. But the idea is there isn't a continuous flow. It's not like there's a total cycle of electricity flowing. It's just staying put. Uh, you'll also need to know a little bit about cells and batteries. Uh, an electric cell is a device that stores chemical energy uh, and then converts that chemical energy into electrical energy through chemical reactions. So in other words, some sort of chemical reaction occurs within a battery uh, and that releases electrons, which causes uh, current electricity to flow. Uh, now a battery, of course, is just a chain of electric cells. So we often use the word cell and battery interchangeably, but really they are different things. Uh, a true battery is a bunch of cells put together. Uh, now, dry cells are one type of cell. They use a paste of chemicals to produce electricity. So inside of a dry cell, kind of like a AA or a AAA battery, um, there, there is a paste that's in there. So it's not totally wet or dry. It's like a more like a pasty sludge. Uh, and in that sludge, of course, there's chemicals that do a chemical reaction uh, and emit electrons. Uh, now, wet cells, which are found in car batteries, they actually use a liquid electrolyte, and usually it's sulfuric acid, uh, to produce electricity. So it operates on the same principle. The whole general principle here is uh, you have some sort of electrolyte chemical that's doing a chemical reaction which, cause, which is causing electrons to be released uh, and electricity therefore to flow. All right, next up, voltage, current, and resistance. You'll need to know this formula. I'm not going to give it to you. Uh, so in other words, you should have it written down on some sort of a cheat sheet or something that you put together for yourself. Up to you, however you want to do it. You can even draw this triangle because this triangle is useful for a lot of us. Uh, v equals IR, that's the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. Remember voltage, which of course is the V, and it's measured in, of course, volts. This can be thought of how much energy or how much oomph each electron in the current carries, right? So in other words, it's just how much push there is uh, in the current electricity. Uh, now current, of course, which is I in the formula, but it's measured in amps, which can be shortened to an A. I know that can be confusing for some, it's just amps is what we measure current in. Uh, this can be thought of as how much electricity is flowing, right? So uh, back when they originally were finding all this information out about electricity, I actually stood for intensity because uh, it was thought that current is basically the intensity of your electricity, which is true to an extent, but current is a better way of putting it than, uh, than intensity. Uh, next one up there is resistance, of course, which is R. That one's measured in ohms. Remember, the symbol for an ohm is the Greek omega symbol. Looks like that. Um, so resistance can be thought of as how much of a challenge the conductor is providing the electricity to uh, flow through it. Uh, so in other words, uh, maybe that's not the best way of wording it. I guess, I guess a better way of putting it is it's just basically how hard is it for electricity to flow. If you have a high resistance, it's going to be hard for electricity to flow. Uh, now this triangle is really useful for using this relation. Uh, how it worked was you just cover the one thing that you want, and then the other thing left over is basically what your formula is. So let's say you wanted to find resistance. If you wanted to find resistance uh, and you knew your voltage and your current, you could just cover resistance in this triangle. And then you see, oh, okay, so resistance is V over I, right? So vol uh, not velocity, voltage over uh, your current. That would give you your resistance. Um, but again, you don't have to use that triangle. You could always use this if you're good at like algebraically manipulating this, so moving the letters around. Uh, that, that is an option as well, of course. Uh, next thing up is electrical circuit diagrams. You will need to know how to draw these, uh, so make sure you have access to this uh, this chart right here that I've shown you several times about all the symbols. Uh, it would also be very useful for you to have an understanding of the difference between a series circuit and a parallel circuit. So in other words, a series, of course, the electricity flows in a line through all of your loads. Remember, it comes from the negative end towards the positive end, so the electricity in this case is flowing this way. It's going to go through all of these loads all at once. 
and make its way back to this positive end. Now, if one of these loads went out, like let's say this one did, uh, your circuit is now broken. So in other words, you don't have a continuous circuit here. You wouldn't have any electricity flowing. Uh, so all of the light bulbs would go out if even only one of them did. Uh, now for a parallel circuit, however, though, there's always another path. So even though electricity can flow this way, uh, if this bulb went out, it can still flow this way, no problem, and still make its way back uh, to the positive end, right? So in a parallel circuit, if one of them went out, uh, the other ones would be just fine, as long as they were in separate parallel circuits, okay? Uh, and again, you will need to know most of these symbols. Again, we didn't ever really use these ones right here, so I wouldn't worry about those three too much. Um, but the other ones are definitely fair game. Maybe even not even resistor. We don't really use that one too much either. The rest of them, though, that for sure, those are the rest that are definitely fair game. We use those a lot. Uh, forms of energy, this might be just useful to, uh, to know. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You don't need to know the difference between kinetic energies and potential energies, but the ones that I want you to understand uh, are thermal energy, of course. So a toaster would convert your uh, electrical energy into thermal energy, for instance. Uh, mechanical energy is a big one. A motor would convert uh, electrical energy into mechanical energy. Um, and then looking at the other ones here, I guess the only other one that you really actually need to know is chemical energy, and that's just only in the context of talking about cells and batteries. So that's up to you. Anyway, moving on. Uh, all right, power. So it seems like now we're getting to the stuff we really recently covered here. Uh, power is actually special because it has two totally different formulas that can be used to calculate it. Power is equal to I times V, uh, which is your current times your voltage. So that's one way of finding power. But another way of finding power, and my preferred way because it makes a lot more conceptual sense is power is equal to energy divided by time. Uh, and that really is a better way of thinking about power, although both of these formulas can be used to find power, and depending on your situation, you could use either one. Um, like, again, if you were given a current and a voltage, you'd have to use this one. Um, but power equals energy over time is nice because it tells you that your power is just how much energy you use per however much time. Now, the unit of power is a watt, and a watt literally just stands for one joule, or how many joules rather. So one watt would be one joule per second, right? So if you had, uh, you know, I don't know, a 100 watt light bulb, that means for every second that that light bulb is on, it's using 100 joules of energy, right? So 100 watts is 100 joules per one second. That's what that really means, okay? So easy enough to convert those. Uh, if you want the triangles, because if you find that's an easier way to do it, uh, we can just create our own triangles for this because it's I and V times in together. We can tell you right there, that I and V need to be on the bottom of this kind of a triangle, uh, and then P would have to be on the top, right? So power, if you cross that one out, is I times V. Uh, likewise, for this one, I could rearrange this and say that P times T equals E, and now it's more clear for this one that its triangle will look like E over P and T. So if you want to copy those ones down as well, uh, that works just fine. You can pause right here and just jot them down on a cheat sheet somewhere. Uh, it's up to you entirely, but again, you will need to use, uh, use those that is fair game on that, uh, on that exam. Uh, next up, motors and generators. This is what can be a little bit tough. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a really good understanding as to why these work. Uh, before we talk about why they work, let's remind ourselves that devices that convert electrical energy into mechanical energy are motors, but things that convert mechanical energy, so moving energy, into electrical energy are called generators. In their design, they're nearly the exact same thing, right? So they're not like fundamentally different. Uh, it's just a motor has a power supply uh, and a generator does not, but you have to be the one providing that mechanical energy to create uh, the electrical energy, right, in a generator. Uh, unless it was a, like a wind power generator, for instance, or a hydro generator, right? Then you have to have something that provides that mechanical energy, that movement, uh, to actually get it to spin. And even in a coal plant or a nuclear plant, uh, the thing providing mechanical energy is highly heated water, so it'd be steam that would be pushing a bunch of turbines and causing them to spin. Uh, now, just so we understand how this works, like a really, really important thing here is uh, how it basically works. Let's just focus in on a motor so we don't get ourselves confused. Now, how it basically works is you have your electricity flowing into uh, basically a, like a horseshoe shaped kind of ring. I think I called it a fly swatter in my previous videos, but like you get the idea, like a horseshoe or a fly swatter kind of shaped ring uh, of a conductor. Now, when electricity flows through a wire, there's actually a magnetic field that's buzzing around it. Now, if you have that magnetic field buzzing around this wire between two stationary magnets, a north end and a south end, those stationary magnets are gonna interact with that buzzing magnetic field around the wire that's carrying a current, which is gonna cause it to start moving. Like it's gonna be magnetically attracted or reflect, or sorry, or repelled uh, from one of these other magnets. So that's gonna start causing it to spin a little bit here. 
And then as it spins, there's like a little split ring in here like this. You see that little split line that shows up within this animated picture here? As soon as that split line passes, now all of a sudden, because that end of the, the coil is connected to the other end of this coil of wire, all of a sudden now your electricity is flowing through the other bar of this, causing this process to continue repeatedly, right? Now that would be producing what we call direct current electricity, so DC electricity, uh, because the current is always flowing, generally speaking, in one way. It's going from this guy, let's say, call that the negative, to this guy, let's say that's the positive, okay? So again, if you wanted to break it down as simple as possible, how does a motor work? A motor works by uh, putting a, an electric current through a coil of wire, which creates a magnetic field, which causes it to spin, uh, and then there's a split ring commutator, which causes it to go in the other arm and causes this to happen in a repeating pattern. That's about it, okay? It is kind of complicated. It is kind of hard to think about sometimes. You might want to research this a little bit more if you don't like the way I've been explaining it. Just Google it, how do motors work, uh, and hopefully you can find something that jives a little bit better with you. Uh, I know there are some videos on YouTube, actually, that are, are, are really detailed and really break it down. Uh, you can have a look for some of those uh, on your own as well. Do a little bit of independent, independent research here. Anyway, moving on. All right, I think this is the last thing we're going to talk about here. I could be wrong, but uh, it's one of the last things at the very least. Efficiency. Uh, the efficiency of an electrical device is the ratio of the useful output energy to the total input energy, usually expressed as a percentage. Now, in this class, we'll always express it as a percentage, so don't worry. Uh, so basically, it's just how many joules of useful output, so what are you actually getting out of it, divided by how many joules of input you put in there, so what was it actually drawing in terms of, uh, of electrical energy. Uh, and then, of course, I'll give you a decimal, so you need to times it by 100 to turn it into a percentage. The input energy is typically the power rating on the label. Uh, so in other words, uh, let's say, again, you had a 60 watt light bulb, uh, then 60 watts, 60 watts, first of all, remember that means 60 joules per one second. So in other words, if you're only running the light bulb for one second, like you just turned it on and then turned it off after a second, uh, you would say that your input energy is 60 joules. Uh, now in terms of your output, that's hard to measure it. Uh, some appliances though actually have it listed, right? Not all appliances, I know microwaves usually do. Uh, most other appliances don't, um, but it can be hard to measure. But let's say you were able to measure it somehow. Uh, and let's say with a light bulb, you got five joules of energy in a second of light out of it, right? So it'd be five divided by 60 and then times by 100, that would be your efficiency. Anyway, that's it. Wow, that was quick. All right, so for practice, uh, do any of the previously assigned textbook questions that you haven't yet completed. So if you've kind of fallen behind on some of those, make sure you get those done. Those will be super useful. Uh, for your unit exam, of course. Um, but most importantly, the number one thing you gotta focus on here is the Electrical Principles Review Slideshow Project, uh, which of course just opened the other day. Uh, it is due on Wednesday, I guess that's Wednesday the 10th of June. Let me just look at my calendar real quick, if it ever lets me load my computer calendar. There we go, all right, yeah, Wednesday the 10th of June. Uh, again, I'm recording this right now on Tuesday the 2nd, so of course it's gonna be a while off, but uh, by the time you guys are watching this, of course, we would already uh, explain what this project is all about. The post is on Google Classroom. It's been open for a few days now. Uh, and remember, the other thing that's really important with this, and you might groan and you might go, oh, oh gee, I don't know if I want to do that, whatever. When you complete it, though, just do not only myself, but also your, yourself here a favor uh, and show your presentation to your parents or guardians, right? Uh, and the reason I'm getting you to do this is not just to, like embarrass you or whatever. The reason I'm asking that you do this is so that you can talk the information through. You can actually literally speak about it. Uh, and when you're speaking about it, you might go, oh, wait a minute, I don't actually know as much as I thought I knew, right? Oftentimes you don't realize until you start talking about something, how much you know or don't know about a subject. So if you just show your parents your slideshow to say, hey, this is what I put together, um, hopefully that'll kind of illustrate whether or not you actually know what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, just go back uh, and, you know, look at the material again, watch some of the old videos if you have to, or reach out to me via an email and just say, hey, you know what I realized as I was talking about, it, I have no idea how a motor works. Do you have anything else I could watch or something, right? Just let me know, okay? Uh, anyway, your work's cut out for you. I'll give you uh, the rest of today, of course. I've only been about 15 minutes in this lesson. I'll give you the rest of the day, work on that project. It is due by the end of Wednesday the 10th. I've blabbered your off enough already. Uh, and again, if you need any help, please let me know.